أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back to our ongoing commentary of Surah Al-Hadid, chapter number 57 of the Holy Quran, the chapter of the iron. And this evening we're going over session, or rather this evening we are at session number 13. And we'll be reviewing verses in this uh, passage or in this series, verses number 16 through to 19. Now as we said from the beginning of this discussion, that the overall arching theme of chapter 57 of Surah Al-Hadid is this concept that Allah has put forth of the institu institutionalization of charity, of doing good, of helping other people, of helping the believers, of helping even non-believers when their need arises. And so that is the overall arching uh, concept that is embodied within, within this entire chapter of the Quran. And as we mentioned, that uh, there are multiple subsections also that speak about various other topics, but they are somehow also related to the overall arching theme. This evening in our discussion, as we go through this next section, of verses 16 through to 19, the main sub-theme is that of why does the Prophet, that is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, why does he live like ordinary people? And we won't be looking at this particular topic today, but this is the overall arching subtopic. Uh, but for today, the very first issue is embodied in verse 16, is found in verse 16. And that's going to be about the importance of having humility of the heart uh, for Allah or in the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal, of our Creator. What is the importance of being a humble individual, of having humility, of having reverence for God, for having that love and awe for Allah? such that that would hopefully help us to prevent ourselves from committing sins, from going against the rules of our Creator. Now before I go into the verse for tonight, verse number 16, we need to actually look at the history of revelation of this particular verse. And as we said at the beginning of our discussion, uh, in our first session that is, that this chapter was revealed in Medina, it is a Madani chapter of the Quran, and what that means, as we had mentioned, and you can go back and review that uh, introductory discussion, but just to give you a summary, is that this was revealed after the migration. So as we know that the first 13 or so years of the Islamic movement it was in Mecca. And once the pressures continued to mount on the Muslim community, Allah gave the order to the Prophet to leave Mecca. And there was a community waiting in what was known then as Yathrib, they were waiting for the Prophet. They had promised that they would accept him, that they would um, obviously give him the controls of the, con of the community, of the society. And so when the opportunity arose and Allah ordered the, the, the migration to happen, the Prophet moved with the companions and his family members to the blessed city of what is now known as Madinah al Munawwara or Madinah al Nabi. And so this chapter was revealed in that era at that time after the migration. Islam had already been around, this religion, the Quran had been uh, coming to the Prophet for the last 13 or so years. And there were still lots of people obviously coming to Islam, people who were uh, of Jewish tradition or Christian tradition or who were polytheists, who were now converting and becoming Muslims. So it's in that light that this verse is revealed and this chapter is revealed. And scholars say that actually this particular verse that we will review this evening was revealed one year after the migration. So also we should keep in mind that you still have two distinct groups of people amongst the Muslim community. You have the true Muslims, those who are devoted to the cause. And then you have the people who are the munafikun, the hypocrites, those who outwardly pretend to be Islam, but do not have the least uh, sense of commitment within their hearts. So what is the revelation historical basis? The scholars of the Quran, and most notably we'll refer to Ayatollah Makaram Shirazi in his Tafsir Namuna, he states that a group of the companions who were actually again hypocrites, the Manafikun, they came to the great companion Salman al-Muhammadi. Now we know Salman because most people refer to him as, as Salman al-Farisi. Uh, but as hadith tell us that don't refer to him as Salman al-Farisi, but rather refer to him as Salman al-Muhammadi. So we will respect that tradition of the Ahlul Bayt and we'll refer to him by his honorific title of Salman al-Muhammadi. In any case, the companions came to Salman and said that, teach us of the Torah, of the book given to the Jews. It's as if they didn't care about the Quran. 
And perhaps they were doing this to kind of deflect attention uh, because, again, these were hypocrites. They didn't care about Islam, right? They may have been Jewish people who had converted. They may have been Christians. They may have been uh, polytheists. Uh, but in any case, they wanted to deflect attention from the Qur'an and the beauty of the Qur'an and the words and the power of the Qur'an and the transformative nature of this book of Allah. So they told Salman that, Salman, why don't you teach us or tell us some stories about the Torah? What's, com what's within the Old Testament? And obviously he don't think he cared to really talk much about the Torah. He was after all a Muslim. He had converted. He had been a great devotee of the Prophet and a ardent supporter of the family of the Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt, namely obviously Imam Ali, peace be upon him, and the daughter of the Prophet, Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her. And as, he continue, as they continued to push to learn about the Torah, Allah revealed this verse, first of all, from Surah number 12, chapter Yusuf, uh, the chapter of Yusuf, rather, Joseph, as he's known by his biblical name, the son of Prophet Jacob, Prophet Ya'aqub, peace be upon him. Verse number 3, in which Allah says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَسَسَ Let's try that again. نَحْنُ نَقُصُ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَسَسِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَإِنْ كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ We narrate to you, meaning to the Prophet, the best of narratives, أَحْسَنَ الْقَسَسِ By our revealing to you this Qur'an, though before this you were certainly one of those who did not know. So this verse was revealed obviously to the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, may God's blessings be upon him and his family. It made its way to Salman, and these people, these hypocrites who are asking, teach us the Torah, teach us the Torah, teach us what is in the book given to Moses. He gave them this, telling them obviously that, look, you want the Torah, but the Quran is Ahsanul Qasas. It is the best of narratives. Why do you want to go back to a book from 2,000 years ago? Why do you want to waste your time with old news when you have fresh revelation from Allah? Well, you have fresh teachings that are coming to you right now as we speak from Allah. So his response was clear that, look, Quran is the best of narratives. Forget about what the Jews were given. That's irrelevant today. It's not worth anything. If there's any validity in it, even today for us in 2020, if there's any validity of the Old or New Testament, that can only be corroborated by the Quran. Everything else needs to be rejected. And Salman was saying, look, the Qur'an is here. The Prophet of Islam is amongst us. Take from his teachings. But they weren't satisfied. And so as I told Makaram says, a few months or some time passes rather, and they come again, these hypocrites, these munafiq. They come to Salman and say, Salman, come on, teach us something of the previous revelations. Give us some of the guidance that came in the other books. Again, Salman didn't want to look and talk about previous books and previous communities and what they received because, as I said, what benefit is there? Right? Even today, in 2020, for us to read the Bible, okay, I won't say there's no benefit, but with so much uh, adulteration and corruption and uh, changes in the Bible, we don't even know what's what's word of God and what's the word of man. What's the word of the translator? What's the word that was actually given to the prophets? So, yes, we read the books sometimes. We read the books of the Old Testament or we read some of the books of the New Testament. But ultimately, the Quran is our guiding light and our book of salvation. So, when these hypocrites came the second time, Allah revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, may God's blessings be upon him and his family, this verse from Surah Al Zumar, chapter 39, verse 23, in which Allah told Obviously Salman, but obviously he was speaking to these hypocrites and all the world. Where Allah says, Allahu nazzala ahsan al-hadith kitaban mutashabihan mathani taqshairu minhu juludu al-ladhina yakhshawna rabbahum thumma talinu juluduhum wa qulubuhum ila dhikrillah thalika huda Allahi yahdi bihi man yasha wa man yudhlillahu fama lahu min had. Allah has revealed the best announcement, Ahsan al-Hadith, a book conformable in its various parts, repeating, Whereat do shudder the skins of those who fear their Lord. Then their skins and their hearts become pliant, become soft to the remembrance of Allah. This is Allah's guidance. He guides with it whom He pleases. And as for Him whom Allah makes to err, there is no guide for Him. 
So Salman first told them this Quran is Ahsun al Qasas, the best of narratives, the best of stories. Now he's coming because they ask him a second time. He's saying this is Ahsan al Hadith. It's the best of announcements. It's the best of speech. It's the best of words. And not only that, but he's showing them look, if you really are Muslims, right, he, maybe he knew they were hypocrites, perhaps. But he's saying, look, if you're really Muslims, this Quran is the best speech. You don't need the Torah. You don't need the book of Moses or the book of Jesus. This book should make your skin go into a state of awe. Your whole body should be in a state of awe and reverence and love for Allah. And your skin and your heart should become soft and pliant and malleable to the remembrance of Allah, to the dhikr of Allah. Again, he was showing them that you don't need previous scripture. Yes, you can maybe read it if you want to just, you know, uh, go through what has been corrupted and altered throughout history from the last 2,000 years or 600 years from the time of Prophet Jesus. But he's saying that, look, the Quran is all you need. And still, they weren't satisfied, obviously. Because at the end of the day, as I've said, they were hypocrites, they were monophic, and they didn't really care about Islam. It was a personal agenda. It were There were personal motives that they had for why they converted to Islam. Why they, apparently that is, converted to Islam. So they kept pushing, pushing and pressuring Salman al-Muhammadi, teach us something. And after the that first verse came down, after this verse comes down to Surah Al-Zumar, after the first verse from Surah uh, Yusuf, the second passage from Surah Al-Zumar comes, now the third verse comes down, which is our verse that we want to review tonight. From Surah Al-Hadid, chapter 57, verse 16. And what does Allah say in there? He tells the Prophet and tells the believers and tells these hypocrites, أَلَمْ يَعْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَّلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَتَالَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَقَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ this verse makes a very open and very blatant statement condemning the previous generations. Not only the, the generations not condemning them blanketly or for no reason, but condemning them for their alteration of religion, for their rejection of the teachings of their prophets, and warning the believers not to be like those who, were the, who came in the past. So Allah says, Has not the time yet come for those who believe that their hearts should soften with humility? and submit to Allah to strive in His cause in the face of Allah's remembrance, the Qur'an, and what has come down of the truth, meaning the divine teachings. So Allah was speaking to these hypocrites directly in a way, and obviously the, the world, all of the Muslims, non-Muslims and the hypocrites, saying that, look, you're pretending to be Muslims. Alam ya'ni amanu. Allah is using the word iman here, but He means obviously those who have uh, Islam, has not yet the time come for those who have submitted their hearts and who believe that they should, um, that their hearts should soften, and that their hearts should soften with the remembrance of Allah. They had an opportunity to hear about much of the Quran in this last time, in the last many, you know, whatever how long they have been pretending to be Muslims, and they're putting on this charade and masquerade as being Muslims, but they're actually hypocrites. So Allah is telling them, look, if you didn't accept what I told you in Surah Yusuf of Ahsanul Qasas, the Quran being the best of stories, if you rejected the passage of Surah Zumar, which the Quran was called Ahsanul Hadith, the best of narratives, the best of speech, the best of words, then Allah is now saying, don't you think it's time that your hearts should uh, become humbled and soften? in the remembrance of God and that, or in the remembrance of Allah and that which has been revealed uh, of the truth. What has come down to the truth, meaning this book of Allah, this Quran, this is the book of truth after all. As we had seen in a few, in a few verses in our previous discussion. And then Allah tells these people who are again monophaki and the hypocrites, and obviously all believers, وَلَا يَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ don't be like those who were given the book before you, meaning the Jews and the Christians primarily, but even other people who were Ahlul Kitab. Don't be like them. And now, obviously, for me to be able to describe to you what the Jews and Christians were like before, 
would take obviously years to discuss because the Quran speaks about them very clearly and condemns large swaths of the Jewish community for their mocking of Prophet Moses, their prophet, for turning their back on him, worshipping the golden calf, then being forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, um, being deprived of food, them asking for food, them getting different kinds of food, them being non-grateful to God. And the story goes on and on and on in the Quran. And Allah even speaks about the Jewish uh, the Christian community rather, um, and, and their own actions, or those who called themselves Christians, I should say, and those who called themselves Jews, um, because there is no religion called Judaism. We don't accept that. This is a man-made condition, or Christianity. That is a man-made name because Jesus did not preach Christianity. If you want to go back to it, then what did Prophet Adam believe? He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a Jew. Neither was Abraham. So, although that's a different topic for a different day, Allah here just tells them, don't be like the people that were given the book before you. The Jewish people, the Christian people. Fatala alayhim al amad. Allah says that a long time has passed after they have received a book. In the case of the Christian community, it's over, what, 600 years since the ascension to Pro of Prophet Jesus. For the Jewish community, maybe 2,000 years perhaps, or maybe five, uh, 800 years, maybe 1,000 years since their last prophet, whoever that was from the uh, tribes of Israel. A long time has passed, Allah says, after they received the book. فَقَسَّتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts have become hard. Not because it's Allah's fault, because He didn't send more prophets, but rather He sent the messengers. He sent the guidance, but the people unfortunately rejected their prophets. So Allah says, فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts became hardened. Their hearts uh, seized. Their hearts stopped working. They lost that empathy and love and care and ability to recognize the word of God when it comes down to them. And then Allah ends by saying, وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ A majority among them have been transgressors, have been open sinners, have been rebellious against the rules of God. So Allah is showing us, brothers and sisters, that, and this is a warning to us as Muslims as well, don't just think that Allah is reprimanding the Ahlul Kitab here. He's telling the Muslims indirectly that don't be like these people. We look at Islam, 1400 years have passed now since the dawn of this religion. Prophet of Islam died in the year 60, or died in the year 11 rather, after the Hijrah. We're over 1400 years since that death of the Messenger of God. And just as the Ahl Kitab, their hearts have gone hard, and a majority of them have gone to become transgressors, we have to ask ourselves, Muslims, the exact same question. Look in the mirror, because the Quran is a mirror for us. If we see deviation in the previous generations, we have to recognize the fact that our own generations may also become deviants if they haven't already. So this is a thing to keep in mind because again, this is coming down to Muslims in Medina. It was, yes, speaking to the hypocrites, as we've said, but it's also speaking to the Muslims that don't be like those who, you know, were given a prophet, who were given divine teachings, and then time passed. And that time, rather than strengthening your iman, your faith, conviction, you ended up deviating from the path. You ended up deviating from the truth. So, again, this is not only a, 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 um, a description of the Jewish people and the com Christian community, a majority of them, but also Allah is showing us as Muslims that you will potentially fall into the same pit as the previous generations. If you don't refer to your book, if you don't read this book, if you don't reflect on this book, if you don't try and implement the teachings of this book, you will fall into the same pit that the previous generations fell into. Let me go to a story that's mentioned also by Ayatollah Nasim Akaram in Tafsir in Namuna of the power of this verse and its relation to the story of Fudayl ibn Ayyad. This is narrated by all Muslims. They speak about this man and the concept of zuhad, of asceticism, of piety, of, you know, maybe what some people might call Sufism. Um, we don't like that term. We'll just call it spirituality and a, a spiritual awakening, I, I would say. 
And they say that Fudail was obviously, uh, he was, a, first of all, first and foremost, he was a Muslim. He prayed, he fasted, he did all the obligations of Islam. But he was like many people had many vices. He was a part of a gang. You know, like today we have gangbangers, we have gangsters, and sometimes even in the Muslim community. He was a similar man, unfortunately, at a, at a time in his life, he was a gangbanger. He was involved in no good. He was involved in rob, in robbery and theft and things like of, of this nature, of a ne very negative nature. And his reputation was unfortunately known. It, it actually superseded him wherever he went. Um, but he had a massive, massive change of heart in his life. And it all comes down to this verse of the Quran, actually. So scholars mention that, you know, he was involved in a lot of things. And one time he saw this beautiful woman and he wanted to, you know, be with her by any means that he could, whether it be, you know, through legal means of marriage or illicit means of, God forbid, raping the woman, which obviously is a, is a crime and it's a sin in Islam and it's never condoned. And he was a Muslim again, as I said, but he was not a good Muslim, you know, much like today we have a lot of Muslims, unfortunately, who uh, call themselves with Muslim names. They pray, they fast, they do the actions, but unfortunately, they let temptation get the best of them. So Fudail was one of these people. So anyways, the story goes is that he found out where, he, where this woman lived and he basically wanted to break in and, and do what he wanted to do with her. So as he's scaling over the wall, right, not like the houses of today where they're open, we maybe have a fence in the backyard, they had kind of walls over their home, maybe six foot, eight foot, ten foot wall surrounding the entire house. He's scaling the wall and in the middle of the night and one of the neighbors is reciting Quran. One of the neighbors is reciting Quran and they're actually reciting this verse of the Quran. Alam yatni lilladina amanu an taqshaha kulubahum and till the end of the verse. And as Fudail is scaling the wall to go and, you know, God forbid, rape this woman, he hears this verse and he stops at the top of the wall. He's perched on the wall listening to this verse, thinking to himself, who is this verse speaking to? Who is this verse addressing? Who is this verse intending to deliver its message to? And he realized that, that in, at that split second, in that, instant, uh, in that instance of time, that this verse was speaking to his heart. You know, maybe we have this moment sometimes, we find ourselves in a, in a, in a pit, in a spiritual pit, at the bottom of, of, what, you know, of, of, of life, and we open the Quran maybe one day at a random page, and we look at a verse and... We think, subhanAllah, it's as if Allah is speaking directly to me by that verse that I just opened. You know, like people, they ask us, they'll call the local sheikh of a community and say, do the istikhara for me. Right? Do the istikhara. You know, that itself is a strange theme or a strange word to use, a strange phrase to use. Istikhara literally means seeking of goodness. So when you say, do the seeking of goodness for me, this it's... That's another discussion for another day. And, you know, some scholars don't even like for other people to do istikharas for others. You know, we should ask Allah for ourselves. Why do we ask Mawlana to do me an istikhara? You want good in your life? You should ask Allah for the good. Don't rely on an intermediary to ask on your behalf or point you to what is, you know, what you think. And again, that's a different topic, istikharas and, and the flagrant abuse of it in our communities and the un... Uh, the lack of knowledge of our community members about istikhara. But anyways, sometimes we may have done that. We've opened the Quran on a dark, sad night of our lives and we read a verse that changed us. That's really seeking goodness from Allah. So to go back to the story of Fudail ibn Ayyad, he hears the verse and he realizes that this verse is about me. Obviously it wasn't revealed about him, it was revealed you know, uh, many, many years, 50, 60, 70 years, maybe before Fudail comes on the scene. But he hears the verse, he has a complete change of heart, he comes back down off of that wall, leaves that young lady alone, and he ends up going to some part of town. And there is a caravan there. 
and the caravan was either coming or they were going out of town and they recognized the fact that Fudail was coming. And they started making a commotion that we need to get out of here, we need to run. Fudail's a bad news, he's a, he's a thug, he's a hooligan, he's a, no, you know, he's a, he's a vicious guy and if he catches us, our, our stuff is going to be gone. And Fudail is hearing all of this. He's had that change of heart on the wall. He's hearing these people talk about him in this bad way and he says to himself, what am I? What's wrong with me that I'm, I'm, I'm so despised by the people that they can't even trust me when I'm, you know, you know, in their vicinity? And historians say that Fudail had that change of heart. This verse changed him. Just listening to it. He didn't have to have a Molana come and tafsir it and, and give a commentary of it and give an explanation of it. He just heard the Arabic. Obviously, he understood Arabic, but he heard the Arabic and he changed his life. He didn't need a one-hour lecture on a Thursday night or a majlis or this or that to be inspired. This shows us, brothers and sisters, that the Qur'an can inspire and change us. One verse of the Qur'an can change. So anyways, Fudail heard the verse, he heard this commotion, people running away, and he decides to change his life. There's a lot that goes on. I don't want to relate the entire, entire event of Fudail, but at the end of the day, he actually becomes a student and a companion of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, peace be upon him. And according to the historical narration, he actually ends up going to Mecca and living out the rest of his life in Mecca. And apparently on the 10th of Muharram, he passes away. Obviously this is at the time of the 6th Imam, so it wasn't the day of Ashura, 61 Hijra, it was in the time of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, peace be upon him, but it was the 10th of Muharram that he died. The day that Abu Abdullah salam was killed. So it just shows us, brothers and sisters, that this Qur'an that we again put on our rear view mirror or we have the app or we have uh, given it superficial treatment in our majalis and in our gatherings and in our homes, this has the power to change one person by one verse. He didn't need the entire Qur'an. One verse changed the man and he became a person that we are praising today. Had he not changed, we would be re referring to this man in the worst of ways. He would have been a lesson for all that is evil. He would have been a lesson for all of those who want to keep away from sin. But the Quran changed him. And the Quran can change you. And the Quran can change me. The Quran can change anybody who listens to it with an open heart. With a pure, not even a pure heart, I would say, but who's willing or who, who has an ounce of purity. Because the Quran is there to change people who are the worst of criminals. Just as it is there to give strength to the best of believers. Let me close with a hadith and a few points that we can learn from this verse for tonight. This is a beautiful hadith which tells us, Do not speak much without remembering Allah, as this will cause your heart to become spiritually hard. Again, the, the verse that we're looking at talks about people whose hearts become soft through the dhikr of Allah. So the hadith tells us, do not speak much without doing remembrance of Allah because if you do speak a lot without remembering Allah your heart will become hard your spiritual heart will become hard and as the hadith says the heart which has become hard is distanced from Allah and then the hadith goes on to say well, in addition do not look at the sins of the servants of Allah as if you are their master Sometimes we look at other people and say, oh, that person, they're doing that sin. I don't do that. She's doing that sin. I'm not like her. You know, those people, oh, I, they, they talk about other people. I don't do that. The hadith says, don't look at the sins of the servants of Allah as if you are their master. Who are you? You're not the rub. They're doing sins. That's between them and Allah. Or if they're doing something, you think it's a sin. That's between them and Allah, and you don't have anything to do with it. Now, is there a room to discuss Amal bin Maruf and Nahi Anil Munkar here? Of course there is. I don't want to go into that because time is running up, and that's an entirely different discussion. Maybe we can leave it for another day. But don't look at people and, and you know, the sins of others, because as the hadith goes on to say, rather look at your own sins as if you are the, a slave before your Lord. It's like we say in English, when you point one finger at somebody, three fingers are pointing back at you. So you're pointing to that person, they're sinning, they're sinning, they're sinning, they're sinning, but three fingers point back, so how pure are you? 
How close to God are you? How many sins do you do? They're doing that one. But you're doing a sin by talking about their sin and maybe you're doing other sins. So you're doing maybe more sins than they are. Because they're not worried about you perhaps, but you're worried about them. And then the hadith says that recognize that people are of two groups. Those who are tested and those who have been shown mercy. And so the hadith says, have mercy on those who are afflicted with sin and give thanks to Allah for those who have been shown mercy and forgiveness. That's a beautiful part of the hadith, brothers and sisters. People are of two types. Those who are tested, mubtala, wa mu'afa, and those who have been shown mercy. Farhamu ahl al-bala. So those who are sinning, they have mercy upon them. Right? Maybe they don't know what they're doing is a sin. Maybe they're in a state of, of heedlessness and they're sinning. Have mercy on them. Maybe talk to them in private. Guide them. Amal bil ma'roof. Nahi anil munkar. Maybe, honestly, maybe they don't know that they're sinning. And if they do know they're sinning, maybe they need a wake-up call. And maybe you, maybe as a friend or a family member, could be that person to speak to them. So rather than reprimanding and insulting and, and talking about them, and maybe that's why ghibah is, is forbidden in Islam. Right? Rather than talking about them, why not help them? Have mercy on them. And as Allah says, or the hadith says, وَحْمَدُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى الْعَافِيَةِ Give thanks to Allah for those who have been shown mercy. Those who aren't sinners, thank Allah that there are people like that in the community. If you're one of those people, thank Allah that you have been shown mercy by Allah. That you have that level of that you don't sin or you minimize your sins and you don't trivialize your sins. Let me conclude with three points of reflection and we will, God willing, continue this discussion in our next session. Number one is that it is, it is through dhikrullah, through the remembrance of Allah and regular recitation with contemplation of the Holy Quran which brings about humility in the heart. We have to regularly read the Quran, do the remembrance of God, the dhikr of Allah and do it with contemplation, with reflection, with understanding of what we say. That will bring that dhikr of Allah, that dhikr of Allah will bring that, that itmanan, that contentment and that uh, humility of the heart. Number two is that we should study the history of our forefathers to the extent that we can learn from them where they succeeded but also where they, fail, where they failed so that we don't make the same mistakes. Allah told us about the Jews and Christians, the Ahlul Kitab in this verse, that some of them are good. And even till today, there are many good Jews and Christians out there. We don't want to ever condemn an entire community and say that they're all evil or that they're all wicked. No, that's not the case. There are many good Jewish people out there. There are many good Christian people out there. There are many good people who follow the teachings of divinely sent prophets. But at the same time that we have to give them the level of respect, we also don't want to just neglect the past. We have to study what happened to the others. Why did they falter? Why did they fail? So we don't fall into the same category and the same uh, situation that they are at that Allah has to reprimand those in the Qur'an. And third and last point we conclude with this is that it's not enough to provide someone with the tools of guidance. That's not enough just to give them the tools of guidance on their own. They must also have the mental and spiritual readiness to benefit from these instruments. As we saw with this individual, with Fudail, that he... Um, had the guidance, we can say. He knew the Arabic. He was a Muslim. He apparently had probably read the Quran or heard it at some time in his life. But he didn't have the spiritual readiness to accept it at that particular time. And so we have to realize, brothers and sisters, that all of us are on a journey to Allah. Some of us are getting, uh, have gone further. Some of us are a bit far behind, are a bit behind, rather. We're all on a journey and we're all trying to get to the destination. And so sometimes we see people like our sisters who don't unfortunately wear hijab, unfortunately. Rather than talking bad about them and shaming them and insulting them and um, you know, using negative language against them, why don't we realize that they're on that journey as well and they haven't really become mentally and spiritually prepared? Now that doesn't, uh, that doesn't condone a person not fulfilling their obligation. I'm not saying that we you know, just let it go. But we have to re recognize that people are on different uh, stages of that journey. 
And if a woman in our community is not wearing hijab, we obviously should encourage them. They hopefully know the obligation. And we have to encourage and promote this uh, cause within Islam, within our communities. And that goes for everything, not just the ladies. I mean, that's unfortunately the uh, main thing that people tend to pick on. But there's many men also who don't fulfill their obligations. Uh, and they also have to be called out and the, and, the, and the sins that they do. Not by name, but the sins that are being done, the actions which are being done that are not in line. They also have to improve themselves and make themselves better believers. Uh, we'll continue in our next session to continue in reviewing of Surah Al-Hadid, chapter 57 of the Noble Quran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.